Jesus followers, just like me. So if you're, if you're new around here, this is where we've been this summer. We are moving through the gospel of Mark, looking at Jesus' followers, people who are choosing to follow Jesus and asking the question of what can we, what we can we gain from them? What can we learn? How can we be encouraged and taught and challenged by what we see in them? Because they, they're just like us. They're real people who are, who are choosing to learn and be reshaped as followers of Jesus in a new place in the kingdom of God. And so we jump in asking the question, if Jesus is doing this with them, what does he want to do with me? Mary Kay Ash is the founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics. And she famously is quoted as saying this, everyone has an invisible sign hanging around their neck that says, make me feel important. She says, never forget this when working with people. Mark chapter 10, James and John come and make a bold request to Jesus. This is what they say. They come to Jesus and they say, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And Jesus turns and he says, what do you want me to do for you? They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, we know what they're asking, right? Like this was truly a bold request. To sit at the right and the left of Jesus was asking for the number one and number two places of prominence with him. And what's their expectation? Well, their expectation is Jesus is going to become the king of Israel and, and reset the nation, the throne of Israel back as it should be. And when that happens, we want to be sitting there with him too, right? We want to be have these places with him. And before you get, go getting all judgy, because we'll get there in a second, let's just pause and acknowledge that some of what they're asking for is really good. Like, they want to be with Jesus. Let's just start there. They want to be part of this kingdom that he's coming to establish. And think about everything that they've risked and offered and left in order to get to those places. But this was a bold request. What would motivate them? Why would they think that they had the opportunity to, to ask this thing? Right? When you read this as it starts, you, you are reminded James and John are sons of Zebedee. It takes you back to the initial time when they left to actually become followers of Jesus. They were fishermen being taught by their dad this trade. They were not the trained, the school. They were not the elite. You know these things, right? And they left it all to follow him. And they were, they were elevated out of that, that common status into a high status because they had a rabbi, a teacher who has chosen them. Why else? Not only were they followers of Jesus, but they had been elevated. 
they had been elevated to his leadership group. They became part of the 12 who were different. In fact, they had been empowered into the ministry in a way that that other people were not. Along with the 12, they were equipped and empowered to teach, to heal, to cast out demons, to do miracles like God's stuff in his name. The things that they had seen Jesus do, they were now doing. And not only that, James and John had an inside track even with those who had those things. James and John, and along with a guy named Peter, got to experience some private moments with Jesus that nobody else did. We're in Mark chapter 10. You remember what happened in Mark chapter 9? When Jesus is transformed. He is transfigured. Like he, his whole body changes and his glory is revealed. Like they saw those things. So with all of that background, they come and they're like, okay, well, let's claim our prize, right? Let's, let's go all in. Let's, let's ask for it. Why not? our natural desire for those things, isn't it? Can you relate? Is it just like us? We have a natural desire for approval and acknowledgement and influence, don't we? I mean, you hear us talk about social media a lot around here because it just is like, it's a thing. And in some ways, it's a cancer, but it, it is the, one of the primary places that we go for approval and acknowledgement and, and influence, isn't it? The emotional swings that you can have when you get it and when you don't. How about when, when we play games, not just sports, but even board games? Like last night... Uh, two nights ago, I was playing cornhole with my son and he was beating me nine to nothing. But they play a version where you get knocked back down if you bust, if you go over. And so it gave me an opportunity to win. And we kept there, like Kristen comes out, Maya comes out. She, they're both saying, we're tired. We want to go to bed. We're like, we're not quitting. We're almost done. Why? What's, what's driving those things? I'm going to beat my kid, right? <laughs> He's going to know that I'm still dad, right? And my six foot five man child kid is like, uh-uh, I'm getting you. Like, and finally, Brady just turned in the middle of it all and he, he turned and he was like, at, at some point, this is just like, we're just like obstinate. Like we're, we're just ridiculous right, right now, right? Because we would not relent. Like we're just, what are we seeking? We want honor. Even if no one else claims it, we want to know it for ourselves, but it's really good when somebody else acknowledges it. You know, that promotion at work, even if it doesn't come with more money, like you want your boss to look at you and say, I could not have done this without you. We need that, right? Jesus turns to them in verse 38 and he says, you don't know what you're asking Can you drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? We can, they answered. Again, don't get judgy yet. I'll let you in a second. We don't talk like this. 
Jesus is like, can you drink the cup that I drink? You know, here's the deal. Imagine I pour out something in a cup and I hand it to you and I'm like, can you drink it? What he's saying is, can you, can you take what I'm offering? Can you accept what I'm calling you to? Because the cup that I'm offering you is the same cup that I'm drinking myself. That's what Jesus is saying. The baptism, like to be immersed in my life, is to take on all of the expectations, consequences that come with this life. Can you do that? Imagine Jesus asking you that today. My challenge, my encouragement is don't answer too quickly. And what were James and John thinking? Like, why did they respond? We can, yeah, sure. I think what they heard was Jesus turning to them and saying, can you, can you lead like me? Well, no, you're Jesus, but I mean, we've seen what you've done, right? Can you teach like me? Can you heal like me? Can you give up that other life and do this like me? Can you drink my cup? You can see James and John like instantly going, we've got this. Like, check. He chose us for this. He's equipped us. He's empowered us for this. We're ready. But the cup wasn't what they expected. The baptism of Jesus wasn't what they expected, to be immersed in him. Like, what did Jesus say? What had he already said? Did you know, we're in, again, we're in Mark chapter 10. Two conversations earlier, in the same chapter, a rich man comes to Jesus and he says, hey, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? If you will, for this conversation, he's asking Jesus, what cup do I need to drink? Right? And Jesus turns to the rich man and he says, sell everything that you have, give it to the poor and come and follow me. And he, he, he goes away sad. And that's the conversation when Jesus turns and he says, how hard it is for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle. It's very hard for the rich to come and, and follow me and the disciples turn and they're like, well, who then can be saved? Like if he can't, what, what about us? And Jesus' response is, it's, it's, with man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And Peter's struggling with this and trying to, he's running himself through this filter and he's going, hang on a second. Like, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. You're saying this is gonna be really hard? It is already hard, right? Can you have sympathy with them for a second? And Jesus turns and he says, I promise you. He's like, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> I promise you, anyone who has left all these things, list everything in life, all the relationships and all your stuff, anything who has left these things will not fail to get a hundred times in this present age. But along with them, persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. He wraps a bow on it and he says, for the last or for the first will be last, and the last will be first. It's a hard teaching. Yeah, there's blessing, there's reward, there's things coming when you follow Jesus, but one of the promises with this thing coming is persecutions are coming too. 
And if you want to be great with following me, like you got to get to the end of the line. It's a race to the bottom, to quote Darren Hollingsworth. The cup that they were expecting is not the cup Jesus was offering. Did you know the very next conversation, the one right before our text, Jesus follows it up by saying for the third time in this gospel, hey, I'm going to die for you. Baptism of Jesus requires immersion into sacrifice. Jesus says in verse 39, he says, you will drink the cup I drink. You will. You will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to to those for whom they have been prepared. For James and John, what they were doing is, it's where we live. It's our natural response to focus on rewards rather than requirements, right? Like we want to know what we get. What's at the end of the rainbow? For us. They came wanting titles and authority and influence and approval. They came wearing their invisible Mary Kay Ash sign. Make me feel important. With their bold request. And Jesus countered it with an even bolder invitation. It was an invitation to sacrifice. It was an invitation to persecution. It was an invitation to humility. Just like it is for us. We're not too different than them, right? Like we would rather focus on re- rewards rather than requirements, or should I say Jesus' expectation of us. I, consider for a second. Do we want heaven without a transforming life of freedom now. Do we want Jesus as our Savior without a really inviting Him to become Lord? Do we want our spiritual freedom without a submitted life that results in love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. See, there there are personal implications to all of this for us. Like very personal implications that we need to begin to wrestle with as we follow Jesus into his kingdom and declare that he is Lord of our lives. And it begins with this. Status in the kingdom of God does not come with titles. Status in the kingdom of God, like an elevated status in the kingdom of God, guarantees it comes with trials. Difficulty. Jesus calls it persecutions. You 
You see, sacrifice, the way of the cross, the cup of Jesus, the baptism of Jesus, the way of the cross, sacrifice is the currency of the kingdom of God. It's what the kingdom of God deals in. It's how we pay out to other people. It's how we get paid to. It's how we have been paid for through the blood of Jesus. There's a guarantee as we move in to this life, there will be sacrifice. There will be loss. There will be even persecution. But there is a reward both now, Jesus promises it, both now and in eternal life, both now and in the future, there is a reward that no money and no titles could ever provide. But when we don't go that way, when we don't deal in the currency of sacrifice, things are guaranteed to go sideways. Let's finish our story and you can see. Verse 41. There we go. When the 10 heard this, they became indignant with James and John. Now, what does that mean? It means that they were angry. They were irate. They actually grieved because they were treated unfairly. Right? How dare them step in line in front of us? How dare them ask for a special place instead of me? What about me? Right? It's all of that thing that's going on. So, again not too different than us, right? What is the natural response to an offense? Anger? Resentment? Broken trust? Beginning to twist someone else's narratives or the narrative of their motives? But it doesn't just stop there. Because as the 10 are doing this, when they start functioning that way with James and John, what happens with James and John, right? They become angry with those who who are angry with them, don't they? They become resentful with those who are resenting them. They lose trust with those who have lost trust with them. They begin to twist narratives with those who are twisting narratives about them. You see, when we elevate ourselves, we don't live in a place of sacrifice. We put ourselves over someone else. It goes sideways and it will always end in broken poop cookies. One of the books that I read this summer is called Leadership and Self-Deception. In page 95, it it says this. Think of it. We provoke each other to do more of what we say we don't like about the other. We provoke the very thing that causes death. And it feeds round and round. Jesus has a different way. Following Jesus means something completely different. Jesus says this, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their officials exercise authority over them. Their experience with tax collectors or people who use their authority to abuse them. The end result, they were were despised and defiled, seen as unclean. 
their experience with Roman soldiers were people who just because of their skin tone, because of their race, had a view of them. And they used their authority over them. There was a law that a Roman soldier could ask them to do whatever they want. They had really no recourse. They were often be asked to carry their, their packs, right? If you got to the Roman governor, well, you're like, this guy has control and rule through the voice of Rome over your livelihood and even your life. Jesus says, what you know about authority, that's not what we're doing. He says in verse 43 and 44, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. See, the status in the kingdom of God comes by serving others. It comes through sacrifice. Placing someone else's needs above our own. Elevating others. Celebrating them rather than yourself. To be important in the kingdom is directly tied to making other people important. That invisible sign that we started with, saying that, that everybody wears, make me feel important, becomes our job description as followers of Jesus as we engage with other people. And then Jesus finishes it here by pointing back to his cup, right? He says, for, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Imagine this for a second. We're landing the plane. Please grab onto this. Jesus the king of the kingdom, God himself. There is no higher authority in heaven and on earth. There is no greater power. There is no one with more ability to demand special treatment. There is no one with more say over your status of your life and your future. And how does he wield that? What does he do with that kind of status and influence and leadership? He uses that power and that authority, his leadership status for your and my good. His concerns are your needs. He is mindful of your desires. He offers himself, his actions, his emotions, his energy for your good. He even offers his life for your life. So I want to close and send us with this. James and John came with a bold request. Jesus countered that with a bolder invitation. And I want to send you with the boldest request of all. And it is what Jesus is driving toward in this text. It's what he is driving toward throughout his entire ministry as he calls people to follow. And it is to become great in the kingdom of God. By becoming like For them, let's run it through very quickly. Let's run it through the, the template of leadership that they were exposed to. He compares it to the Gentiles. What about the tax collector? 
What if a tax collector now becomes a follower of Jesus? How does that now need to go with leadership and, and authority? Or you remember Zacchaeus? Who gave away half of his stuff? He said, if I've wronged you, I'm going to give four times the amount? Well, what if we flip it on its head? What if a... What if a follower of Jesus is now coming into contact with someone like that, someone in authority in a tax collector's booth? What am I supposed to do there? You function with them with the grace and invitation of Jesus. Imagine a zealot who wants to overthrow Rome and a tax collector that has been cheating all of his own people for Rome, coming together and becoming family together as they follow Jesus. That don't work unless we live this way. Or a Roman soldier. Imagine a Roman soldier becomes a follower of Jesus. How does he now wield his authority as he interacts with the common Israelite people? Or when we flip it, how does a follower of Jesus interact with a Roman soldier who is not a follower of Jesus? Well, you remember what Jesus says? Somebody asks you to go one mile with the pack on your back, go two. Make him feel, like read his sign, make him feel important. Do more, sacrifice for his good and see what happens. Same with us. The message is this. Give your life away. Just like Jesus. Celebrate each other's victories. Speak well of each other when they're not in the room. And when they are. Have no concern for titles. Look for someone else's needs and fulfill them when you can, when you can see them. Position ourselves to think and act for the good of everyone we encounter. Y'all stand with me and we're going to end on this reading. Again, in this Leadership and Self-Deception book, there's a quote that says this. Now, in a way, this is quite a miraculous thing. But in another way, it's the most common thing in the world. It happens all the time in our lives, usually on very small matters that are quickly forgotten. All of a sudden, because of the basic otherness of people who continually stand before us and because of what we know as we stand in relation to other people, we are penetrated by the humanity of others. And we know in that moment what we need to do. We need to honor them as people. In that moment, the moment I see another as a person with needs, hopes, and worries as real and as legitimate as my own, I'm free. It's a business book that speaks our story. Let's live free.